Hello, everyone. Welcome to the Social Chrysalis Roundtable. I am Robert Novak. I'm one of the faculty members. And uh, Social Chrysalis, its main focus is about conscious evolution uh, and following the wheel of co-creation by Barbara Mar Marx Hubbard. So every third Wednesday of every month, we'll be bringing you the opportunity to consciously evolve with us and with humanity. And every time we meet from this vibration and consciousness, it benefits all of humanity. So we're very grateful for you to be here with us. So tonight we got another one of our faculty members, Barbara Dorn Drew, co-creator of Creative Aging, that is going to introduce our uh, speaker here tonight, our presenter, and we're very excited to have her. So Barbara, by all means, have fun. Well, all right. First, I, I will reinforce the title, which is When God Was a Woman, Part Two. Sharon was our featured roundtable presenter in October. And it, this one is titled Finding the Divine Feminine Now. All right. So I'm really delighted to introduce Dr. Sharon Maloney this evening, as she is one of the most authentic human beings I've ever met. A visit to her Social Chrysalis course landing page or to her website reveals numerous credentials and areas of expertise in her transformational work to quote, guide women to find, reclaim and embody their sacred female power, unquote. One is immediately struck, as I'm sure you will be this evening, by Sharon's beauty, grace, compassion, sensuality, and calm, nurturing qualities. What we may think of as the archetypal feminine persona. But what may not be quite so apparent is that Sharon is also in touch with the aspect of the goddess that some refer to as the fierce feminism. If needed, she's able to express her outrage at the injustices that are being done to all aspects of the sacred feminine, both human and to mother earth. Sharon is the mother bear who will protect those in her charge to the fullest of her ability, always assisting them to stand solidly in their own truth. In short, Sharon Maloney embodies the total multidimensionality of the archetypal feminine. What a perfect standard bearer to help restore the sacred feminine to its rightful place in the human story. So Sharon, take us wherever you're gonna take us tonight. Well, thank you, Barbara. Well, a glowing introduction. I'm kind of like listening to it as if it's talking about somebody else. It's, it's quite strange when you hear somebody talking you up like that, but thank you for the acknowledgement. And yes, indeed, I am the, um, I guess the torchbearer for my message. So I do have that fire in the belly about what I'm talking about this evening. And I want to thank everybody who showed up on the call today because it's getting to that time of the year when we're all busy and a bit over it. So it means a lot. So thank you very much for, for my panel, who I also want to introduce briefly. So we have Walter and Barbara who um, run the Creative Aging Program on Social Christmas. And we have Leanne who runs a a business program on social Christmas and we have Rebecca's little picture there she's not able to make it tonight on the the um, panel but she's here as a participant so um, for those of you who may have been at the part one of this talk we are going to follow a similar process this evening or this morning if you're here in Australia and so what I'm going to do is share some some knowledge, some thoughts, some insights with you for uh, a period of time. And then we're going to shift into a meditative reflection to allow that, that information and knowledge to land inside your body so that it's not just me talking at you. And then after the meditation, we'll have a few minutes of roundtable discussion with the panel. And then we'll shift back again where I'm going to share a bit more knowledge and information and we'll repeat that same kind of pattern. So um, when I first began doing the preparation for this part two, I thought it was going in one direction. 
And then as often happens, especially when you are receptive to the greater, I suddenly found myself going down this rabbit hole into quite a different place than where I had originally thought. And initially I was like, oh, but I'm supposed to be doing this because I've said this in the email and I kind of wanted to get back to that, but it was very insistent pull that I needed to follow the guidance of where I was led. And so I did. And um and I have to say it was quite a challenging time. The last couple of weeks I've had to really embody and walk my talk about what I'm speaking about this evening. So just know that as we go through um, what I'm about to share with you. So I'm going to share my screen now. I have a PowerPoint that I prepared. And I'll start guiding us through that. PowerPoint, if I can get rid of that. Here we go. So why the goddess? Why this topic? Why am I speaking about this? Because this is a reminder from Eleanor Gaydon, who, who was, I had the privilege of Eleanor marking my PhD thesis. So I have a, a direct connection with her. She reminds us that at this critical time in our evolution, our task is to transcend some of the fundamental tenets of Western culture. What are those tenets? That a male God created the world, that humans have the right to dominate nature, and that man has a right to dominate woman. And those assumptions with their roots in our ancient history have really brought us to a breaking point. And even though all three of those things have begun to kind of decline, they're still um, very much present in our psyche and in our cultural ways of looking at life and the world. So in the Judeo-Christian heritage, which is what most of us grew up with, God is imaged exclusively as male. Is that poor old man in the clouds? <laughs> Most of our religious institutions are still male dominant and that whole tradition is partly based on the rejection of female images of God. And I remember when I was studying this, doing my thesis, that one of the authors that I studied, or well, quite a few actually, named this one-sided focus of the deity as male as a form of idolatry, which I had never thought of before, but it kind of went, oh, that's actually right. It's worshipping part as if it's the whole. So what's that meant for women? That mythology of Eve as the devil's gateway has meant women's continued struggle for self-worth and internalised misogyny, so those critical inner tapes. And then centuries of female infanticide, which is still going on today, physical sexual abuse, domestic violence and homicide. They're pretty sobering realities for women and for men. So why the goddess? Because the symbols and myths and practices from that ancient pre-patriarchal era enable us to re-sanctify the female body. And that goddess spirituality, which I'm going to elaborate on shortly, has a vital role to play because it reveres both the fertile earth body and the female body for their elemental life-giving powers. And... You know, it's my life mission, which is to restore the sacredness of the female body to the planet and, and which, is, which is with me in my waking dreaming 24-7, has arisen out of this understanding that our bodies, our female bodies, are the microcosm of that greater earth body. So current expressions of goddess spirituality provide a spiritual orientation that's embedded in a profound historical tradition and we're going to look at that again, and in the female dimension of being. And, of course, we all have that dimension of being regardless of gender, male or female. So this is a little recap of what, some of what I covered in the part one of this talk. Just going to do a few slides of this as a reminder in case people haven't seen it before. So those ancient archaeological findings from our pre-patriarchal European ancestors showed this overwhelming prevalence of figurines depicting a female deity, the goddess. 
And usually there, you can see in those images on the screen, they're, they're pendulous breasts and big abdomens and buttocks, and they're really a celebration of the, the fecundity and the voluptuousness of the female body and its ability to, to bear and then birth life. And so those um, artifacts reveal our ancestors awe at the great miracle of our human condition, which for the ancients was, a, was even a greater miracle than it is for us because they wouldn't have had an appreciation of, of the role of men in conception and birth. So for them, the miracle of birth incarnated in a, in a woman's body kind of was its own thing. Female body and the processes of menstruation and birth were really seen as a participation in that sacred life-giving power of the goddess. And her body was regarded as the earth. That's the key thing. And so this goddess worship was well-organized, highly complex, more than a religion. It was a lifestyle. It was a whole way of life that existed for some 30,000 years until the beginning of the patriarchy about 4,300 years ago. What was the social significance of venerating a female deity in the female body? Women were key cultural agents, so they're largely depicted in the public sphere. Heads of clans holding significant public office, administering resources and serving as priestesses. So they were, they were very much agents and, you know, cultural icons in some way that it's hard for us to imagine what life would be like, um, you know, in that time. And importantly, women's power is described as an actualization power based on the responsibility and love of the mother-child relationship. So it's not power over, it's power under, power to thrive, power for life in all its forms to grow and thrive and become more of what it is. The evidence also suggests that the earliest European and Middle Eastern cultures were a balanced non-patriarchal and non-matriarchal social system. So sometimes people will say, well, you know, if there was patriarchy, then before that there must have been matriarchy. But the archaeological evidence that is reported by people like Maria Gimbutas, who was an extraordinary um, forerunner in this field, doesn't show that. It shows it's matrilineal, so the descent came through women, but it wasn't women lording it over men. <clears throat> And also importantly, there was this notable absence of any weapons of war, violence and male domination. Again, quite hard for us to fathom a world in which that would be the case. Then there's this demise of the goddess and the history of the patriarchy that is dated to the years 4300 to 2800 BCE when three waves of nomadic tribes with horses and lethal weapons migrated south from the Volga Basin into um, Eastern and Northern Europe. Led by patriarchal chieftains, the invaders wrought large scale destruction on those peaceful agrarian communities who didn't have the kind of arms and weapons that these invaders brought with them. And they replaced the goddess with their sky gods who ruled from the heavens like despots. So that gender change for the deity then legitimized the imposition of a different social order that was based on male dominance. And during that time, the goddess was then reduced to a lewd, depraved figure associated with the unpredictability of nature and unbridled female sexuality. And, you know, when I read that, I remember when I was a young woman and, and, you know, with my good Catholic upbringing, even though I rebelled against that, I still had this idea that the goddess was like exactly that, this lewd, depraved figure that was associated with, <clears throat> you know, not good. So studying this deeply during my um, research journey was such a, um, an enlightening and like such a revelation for me, really, personally. 
And so the supplanting of the goddess by male monotheism and patriarchal rule had profound repercussions. So that's the, the kind of, that's the picture that I painted last time in my talk when God was a woman part one. And it's also, you know, generally understood to be that's how it went historically, right? But then... I came across this alternative history of patriarchy that is offered by Demetra George. And so I just want to introduce all of us to this because I'm still sitting with the implications of what this actually means. It's profound. And how I came to this was that I went back to my thesis. I have one paragraph about this in my thesis and I thought, oh, it would be good to put a slide in about this. And I got to that paragraph and then I went back to her book Mysteries of the Dark Goddess, and that's when I went down the rabbit hole. And then I started searching other places and going, oh, my goodness, this is, like, huge. So that's where we're going. So Demetra George says, the demise of the goddess might not have been due to her suppression and destruction by the patriarchy, but was, in fact, her natural withdrawal into the dark moon phase of her own cycle. And that is consistent with goddess spirituality, with its, its understanding of, of the whole process of life being this round of life, death, rebirth, rebirth, akin to the phases of the moon. So let's explore this a little bit. And I first want to introduce you to Demetra because she's a remarkable woman. She has a master's in classics from the University of Oregon, specialising in archetypal mythology, ancient languages and astrology. She lectures internationally and runs educational pilgrimages to sacred sites in Egypt and Greece and India. And this is a photo of her in Crete, which I thought was a lovely link to our last, um, my last um, talk. And she offers a very plausible goddess-centric explanation for the history of patriarchy. And she does say in her book, look, there's no decisive proof about this. This is my own intuition and my own pulling the threads together of what I'm seeing and intuiting and so I just was captivated by this and wanted to offer it here today because I think it is it, it is profound so just a recap of this moon cycle process that we all know from seeing this amazing lunar body in the sky where there's the birth growth fullness decay, death, and rebirth. That's what we see each month in the phases of the moon. During that time, there's a naturally occurring dark phase where the light disappears for a time. And so what we can do is transpose that lunar cycle as a metaphor to the greater processes of life. So in the dark phase, life cleanses, revitalizes and transforms itself. It's kind of readying itself for its next evolutionary leap. So how does that apply to the demise of the goddess? And what are the larger cosmic cycles behind her disappearance? Let's have a look at them. The transition from matrilineal to patriarchal society also coincided with two vast, these are really long-term cosmic cycles. So the first one is this 40,000 year lunation cycle. And the lunation cycle is really describing that relationship of the moon and the sun as seen from the earth, where, where there are these phases of new moon and then waxing moon, full moon, waning moon, and then dark moon, right? So if you apply that metaphor, what we can see is that in the Paleolithic era, there was this new moon, a new cycle of growth that was signified by the appearance of Homo sapiens. That then culminated in the Neolithic area, that which, which is what we really looked at last time in the experience of, um, of Crete <clears throat> and that fluorescence of art and culture and trade and all of those things. And that was then followed by the dark moon phase. So she's, she's gone through this whole trajectory, the divine feminine. Going into the dark moon phase, 
as the patriarchy began to prepare for another round of growth. Now that huge 40,000 year arc also coincided with a major transition in another very big cosmic cycle, which is this 26,000 year processional age cycle. And the processional cycle is this wobbly pivot of the earth on her axis that's caused by the protuberance around her equator being pulled out by the sun and the moon. And so it's like a, a, a child's top, how it spins on its axis. <clears throat> and as you can see in the, the diagram there, that little circuit takes a full 26,000 years to complete. As it does that, the North Pole shifts. And so the, the vernal equinox also shifts. And this is where we get the procession of the ages. So, you know, most of us have heard the discussion about how we're at the moment, right in this processional age shift from the age of Pisces into the age of Aquarius. And I understood that as a thing, but I didn't understand how it was connected with this procession of the earth. And so when I was, I was reading um, Demetra George's description of it, I was like, oh, that's amazing. And, and at that time, at the beginning of the patriarchy, there was the shift from the age of Taurus, which is feminine in its qualities and so on, into the age of Aries, which is quite masculine. So, so it's, it's fascinating to me that these two overarching, very big cosmic cycles are happening right at that particular shift, the beginning of the patriarchy. So this, this is her take, Demetra George's take on the evolution of Homo sapiens during that past 6,000 years as the feminine principle withdrew into her own dark phase. The masculine principle moved out to shape the mindset and beliefs of humanity cyclic right brain processes, which would have been the dominant feature in pre-patriarchal times, then ceded to linear left brain dominance. A male god and men rose to positions of worldly and spiritual power. And the dark phase of the cyclic re renewal became feared and avoided. And the result of that, this is her quote, spoke to me very powerfully, so I want to read it again. In a society ruled by solar white consciousness, we have been taught to fear, reject, devalue and disempower all that is linked with concepts of the dark. So people of colour, women, sexuality, menstruation, nature, the occult, the pagan, night, the unconscious and irrational, and death itself. So Demetri George points out that if the dark phase was initiated, that's so the dark phase when patriarchy first came in, was initiated by an act of creation, then the demise of goddess culture was a necessary prelude for her evolutionary development. The violence, brutality and chaos that occurred was the result of people panicked by the dark. And it also means that humanity is released from a sense of victimhood because there's a much bigger cosmic process work. I find that really interesting. It's kind of it's the, the bird's eye view where we're not looking at it from a human perspective, but shifting up into that vast cosmic turning of the wheel that we can't comprehend from our, you know, small local self. So now is our time to shift into a little meditation because it's so different, this information, to how we are usually thinking about our lives and this turning of the wheel. So I'm going to find my music and then I invite you to just, if you can, close your eyes and let this information land inside your body. Oops.
So let's take a metaphorical journey into the landscape of the dark moon. We go through a dark moon phase whenever there is a closure of something. A job, relationship, belief system, living environment, our worldview. A loss of a form that's given our life structure and a sense of identity. The dark phase also spans the interval of our transition to something else, a new beginning. And in the dark is where the transformation occurs. Here, matter contained by a form that has fulfilled its function and used up its vital store of energy disintegrates back into pure energy. The high frequency vibration of this medium, transformative process, cleanses and energizes this primer materia and prepares it for renewed and revitalized form making. The dark is a time of retreat, of healing, and of dreaming the future. The darkness is lit with a translucent quality. And during this essential time, life is gestating, preparing to be born. The bear in hibernation, the chick incubating in the egg, caterpillar inside the cocoon, the seed lying in the dark soil. Right now we are collectively at exactly this place, finding our night eyes. We've been accustomed to the glare of the sun, the solar consciousness, it takes a while for our eyes to adjust to their night vision. At this time, we are right now at the beginning of a new 40,000 year lunation cycle, the cusp of another 2,200 year processional age transition. And according to some historians, possibly the closure of an entire 26,000 year processional age cycle. Just allow the import of that to sink in. I invite you to remember that the dark phase is initiated by an act of creation. Knowing this organic process as benevolent and trustworthy can enable us to move through the transition with trust and faith rather than fear and panic. In the lunation cycle, the dark phase is followed by the new moon, emergence of new life, a new form. what might be waiting to be birthed into our world at that time. Okay, so I'm going to invite you now my panel friends. As that meditation lands inside you, I would love to hear any reflection, reflections or responses to what I've just shared with you because it's a very different perspective than what we normally have. 
It definitely um, gets into the whole, uh, I want to say, rebirthing process. Even the uh, meditation you took us through, it's, it, it's um, which of course I never heard the, the things you shared about this. So it's, it's very intriguing. And definitely in the aspect of, you know, the, you know, the darker aspects, whatever else, um, the, the, it's probably, you know, also like our time, you know, going into meditation sometimes because you have to go into that stillness, sometimes that void, that nothingness. And I do believe that's some of what you're, you're, you're getting at and, um, and why we don't go there sometimes because, you know, there is, you know, this unknown and it seems dark, but also know that in that nothingness or that void, when you think nothing's happening, you know, creation is happening. Um, so I think it's very interesting um, uh, perspective. And, um, and that's what I got out of it with what you shared. And then also um, the meditation as well. Mm. Yeah, thank you, Robert. It's, um, it's kind of like we, we know this because we live it. We, we all regularly go through these cycles, right? But we, we tend, I'm going to talk about myself now, we mm -hmm. tend and to think that there's something wrong when I'm in that dark phase, that it's actually a natural process that, that we go through, that the moon goes through, that the earth goes through, that the ages go through. It's like from micro to macro. So, yeah, yeah. thank you. And, and, and people do struggle going there, Yeah. right? Sure. And, and, and that's uh, it's very uh, int yeah, intriguing, very nice, yes. Thank you. Yeah, I will say that it, it is a very different perspective, but it feels as you were talking through it, it feels very natural. It feels, you know, very um, organic and, and I and and right. And it, you know, just seeing around me these past, I would say the last 10, 15 years, especially, you know, the feminine really um, you know, so many individuals, male and female, really stepping into the energy more and more and, and healing through, you know, a lot of that past of that persecution of that, you know, you know, what would happen to the female. So it, it just, it, it feels very much like truth. And, mm. and it's giving me permission to go into that dark, quiet cave to create right i I'm, I'm i'm actually like in there right now and and so often it feels like no i need to be accomplishing da -da 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 -da. you know we need to be doing manifesting and doing all these things but yes. yeah it's such precious time so so just by hearing that i feel like it gives me permission to to really honor and allow it to happen in myself so thank you yeah, such a, a such a great um, affirmation, Leanne, of what I was just saying. You know that that cycle is 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 part of our experience, and if it was normal and accepted, we would all have this collective shared understanding that that it's okay to be able to do that, right? right. Um, right. The thing I want to emphasize is that 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 as we experience that as normal and like you said, organic and natural. It's really important to remember that that's the bigger picture frame as well, because if that's if that's what's going on, then we can trust that process too. No. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. What an exciting time! All of these major, major endings and new beginnings of new eras. Well, right? and, oh. you know, yeah, and it gets us out of this sense of victimhood. You know, like we, we, we're actually participating in something now that is that is trustworthy and we have a very important role to play which I'm going to talk about shortly so yeah thank you yeah Barbara well this this is mind-blowing to me Sharon I encountered the concept of as above so below when I was in high school back in 19 probably 65 mm. and it blew my mind then I said I felt it like this is a truth this is a truth of life that we are the microcosm, as you just mentioned, of the macrocosm. And so often I think 
most of us, we were not raised to look at ourselves as part of a bigger system in any way, shape or form. Mm -hmm. And um, to me, this is really amazing because most, well, the last 2000 years has been coming into a new age, being in the middle of it around a thousand, right? And now we've been in the dissolution or the, the, the uh, ending of this Piscean age, which was all about duality. And it was so male versus female, black versus white. I mean, everything was uh, good versus evil. All of these concepts that were brought yes. in, you had the Taurus age, which you said was feminine and the Aries age, which was masculine. Then you have this sort of pitting them in, in duality as an age and you have the dying God. So even Christ was a crucified God, you know? And so did yes. that lead to, so now we're on the tip just the very beginning, the, the song, and we're dawning of the age of Aquarius. And I have, I feel like, well, I want it to be in the middle of it. You know, this is the beginning of it. We can feel it, we can taste it, but it's about the age of unification. It's harmony and understanding. It's all about oneness. It's accepting all of our brothers and sisters in all of life, the spiritual and the material. And so if you look at this whole evolutionary cycle of um, 26,000 years, we're in a pretty interesting place. And unfortunately, oh. we're just sensing, you know, that's, and I'm even thinking the pandemic has put us into this dark place, what we would have considered a dark, bad, ooh, careful, we have to go into ourselves and be separated from people. Maybe it's the reflective time we need before the new moon. I mean, the new moon, Aquarius, and it's is starting to be in its new moon phase. So, but we have to, Barbara Marks Hubbard said, there has to be a breakdown before a breakthrough. So we have to be willing to let go of that Piscean duality and start. I mean, it's at the beginning, but some of us, the evolutionary pioneers feel it. We know the truth of it. We know that humanity is so much more than what we've been. Finally. So thank you Finally. for placing it in this proper perspective. I'm so excited. I can hardly stand it. <laughs> thank you. <laughs> I, it's like the relief you know the, the sense of relief and, and you know I have a little quote here that talks about cuspal periods which is what we're in this cusp uh -huh. can, can span 500 years this is not an overnight job you know and yet here we are humanity poised right at this moment where we get to make our contribution and that's what I'm going to talk about next but it talks about this quote I have here, like vast sonic plates shifting deep in the collective unconscious, this transition is manifesting as a series of seismic changes throughout our world, the pandemic, the climate emergency, species extinction, and so on. It's like we're right there. Wow. So, so this is a good point into the next piece that I want to share. Hey Sharon, just um, so, real, thank you. real quick, your uh, your husband has a really good point here. She, he put in chat, and I want to share it. Uh, he says the sense of the void being emptiness, nothingness, is perhaps a patriarchal perspective, whereas uh, a feminine perspective, uh, the void is full of absolute and total potential, and going there is to immerse ourselves into this potential and opening ourselves to what it means for me, my community and the universe. Yes. So I think that's well said. Yes, and it's so true. Thank you, Jared, it's so true. It's so true. And you know, we, we are finding our night eyes and you know what it's like when you've been in the glare of the sun and then you go into a dark room, you, you can't see anything, you're blind. And then as your eyes adjust, you can see this shape and that shape and you can find your way. It's, it's the same with what Jared's just said about the void. It's not a nothingness. It's full of all of these potentials. So thank you for pointing that out. So I'm going to go back. I unpinned myself, Robert, just to let you know so that we could come onto the panel. So I'll share my screen again. And we'll continue. So now this is not Demetra George anymore. This is me speaking. In the past century, something exceptional happened that has never happened before in the history of humanity or the history of the planet. 
as human beings, we took over the reins and gained the power to co-create with Mother Earth. So this is kind of like when I think of it, it's like the, the natural consequence of her withdrawal and masculine power coming to the fore, it's gaining control and the power to co-create with Mother Earth. This is a really sober point for us to be facing right now. So this is a quote by Thomas Berry. We now in large measure determine the earth process that once determined us, right? The earth who controlled herself, I'm not talking her, about her as a thing, I'm talking about her as an intelligent conscious being. The earth that controlled herself directly in the former period now to an extensive degree controls herself through us, right? What are the repercussions of that? Carbon dioxide levels. Look at the, I mean, this, we all know this, but I want to do a brief recap because it's the consequence of our now controlling the earth processes. Currently, carbon dioxide levels are at, are at 415 parts per million and rising. That's a 47% increase since the beginning of the industrial age when it was 280. So you can see there that timeline at the bottom is 800,000 years where this is, we're in completely uncharted territory now. This is the latest measurement as of last month. Carbon dioxide has now reached 415 parts per million. So you can see at the bottom left of the graph in 2000. So in the last 15 years, 2005, it was around 380 parts per million. Now it's up to 415. That's a significant rise in 15 years. And a cap, we're talking about a cap of 450 parts per million is technological doable. We can absolutely do it. We have existing technologies to do it, but would be the greatest achievement in the history of the human race, according to Joe Rom, who's a physicist and a climate scientist and a, a science reporter as well. And, and I agree with him, but we, we actually have to do it. This is from Al Gore's Climate Reality Project. These are just, I'm gonna flick through them quickly because we all know that our global surface temp temperature has risen dramatically. So has our ocean temperature risen dramatically. Hotter years typically have more fires. We've seen that in your country in the US. We've seen it in our country here. Last year it was decimated by the worst fires ever. And we have these worldwide extreme weather catastrophes. And all of these things were forecast by the IPCC reports starting back in the mid 90s. So now it's here, it's arrived. So the problem, this is Arkan Lashwala, who's a Peruvian ceremonial leader. I heard him speak recently. The problem, we put ourselves above everything and it's not true that we're, we're that big. So we need to not put ourselves as superior to the rest of the world. The only thing that is superior is the unity of everything. We are suffering because we stopped doing the work with the others, the plants, the animals, the rivers, the lakes, the stars. We are all part of life. We all have a talent and we all need to pull our talents together. That's what the ancient people did. So that's... That's the wisdom of an Indigenous elder. I, I first heard about Arkan Lashwala through the Pachamama Alliance because I'm on their e-list and I get their, their, um, you know, their, their gatherings and he spoke recently and that was, that was, I thought, was such a succinct description of what we're actually confronting right now. So just take a moment. I just want to pause for a moment because that's a lot of really potent sobering information. Just take a moment to breathe, to let it sink in, to remember that the dark phase is initiated by creation, that it's followed by the new moon, and that she is returning now.
we'll come back to that. But I want to continue on as promised in my um, email flagging the content of this call that remnants of the goddess, of that pre-patriarchal goddess culture, have continued right down the ages until now. And there are three main streams that I want to now um, go through so that we can see how she's still here and has been all along, even though it hasn't been in mainstream Western culture so much. So the three main streams are some Indigenous peoples, some Eastern traditions, and in the Saigian dreams of contemporary women and men. So first of all, we're going to look at Australian Aboriginal culture. Indigenous Australians have always honoured sacred women's business, the mysteries of menstruation and birth. And so uh, Hannah Bell, who's I'm drawing from here, lived for a period of time with the people, the Narinian people of Western Australia. And there's this belief that womb blood feeds the unborn, providing identity, form and spiritual connection with the physical world. In that community, sex differences are seen as akin to right and left hands, physically and functionally different, but without hierarchy. And I want to acknowledge that, you know, the dreaming, which derives from this geospiritual source in the ancient Australian landmass. And I live in this country. I was born in this country, and I can tell you it's profound. When I went out to Uluru after I'd finished my thesis, I could feel that geospiritual source coming up through my body. And the first time I ever saw Uluru, which is right in the centre of the country, I just dissolved into tears immediately. It's just so compelling. So this is a country, the dreaming represents the longest continuing religious belief documented in the world. That's a quote from, <clears throat> from, um, from Flood <clears throat> in Christopher Knight's um, book. Some estimates are that Indigenous Australian culture has been here for 60,000 years and some more estimates are that it's been here for double that time. Ancient, ancient lineage that we have the privilege to to live amongst. Rainbow serpent is a key element of the dreaming and it's ritually linked to menstrual synchrony. There's, there's a whole cosmology around that. So I'm just drawing out some small snippets of it that correspond to what I'm talking about with regards to the divine feminine and the female body. But there's a whole, you could spend lifetimes fathoming the symbology of the rainbow serpent and the dreaming. And I'm not an Indigenous person, so I also want to acknowledge that this is my perspective of having studied it rather than, um, you know, having been born as an Indigenous person and been raised in that law. Indigenous paintings, you can see an example of one there, depict the snake as a rhythmic line, a flow inseparably associated with the body of womankind. And one of the core meanings of the rainbow serpent is the cyclic round of alternation metamorphosis and change. So it's very clear the, the analogies and the resonances with our ancient pre-patriarchal goddess cultures. Then there's the Indigenous American traditions. So in the Navajo, this changing woman is the female deity and daughter of Mother Earth and Father Sky. When I was doing my studies, I came across these descriptions of the Kanalda Monarchy Ceremony, and I just, it just was so deeply healing for me to read and study and understand and know how Navajo girls had the opportunity to experience a ceremony that lasted for five days that was participated in by the whole community when they began menstruating. Imagine how your life would change if that was your introduction to yourself as being a menstruating human being, a fertile woman. And during that ceremony, the initiate is understood to become changing woman. So she's mentored and taught about what that means, the responsibilities, the connection with the cycles of vegetation and plant life and human life. The Apache also have a similar tradition where Monarchy is a proud time of celebration. 
and a girl is welcomed into womanhood by her whole tribe. And they have a becoming, becoming a woman ceremony where the girl, again, dances to reenact the legend of changing woman, who was the female deity and also the ancestor of the Apache origin story who birthed their nation. Then we have indigenous Eastern tradition. So this is in India, in Kerala. Goddess worship continues today and menstruation is revered and publicly celebrated as a participation in the creative power of the goddess. And that, that um, the woman who did that research, Diane Jeanette, um, she's a colleague I met in San Francisco years ago and I went over to share my research findings. She did an entire PhD on this Pongala ritual. It's extraordinary. So in 2009, which was the last census that was taken, this Pongala ritual um, made the Ganesh World Book of Records for the largest number of women gathered in one space, and they recorded 2.5 million women participating in this Pongala ceremony. And, you know, those women come from all around the country. They, they, it's a cooking ritual, so they, they cook this um, a kind of dal porridge, I think it is, and it's participating in this ritual is believed to increase their own personal power as well as the Shakti power of the goddess and her capacity to help her devotees. I think that's amazing. I'd love to go. And then in the north of India, in Assam, there's still matrilineal communities who see the earth as the living body of the goddess and the monsoon rain as her menstruation. And see in the picture, long line of those beautiful women in their saris. And in this Ambubachi festival, both the earth body and the female body are represented as profoundly sacred. So again, we can see these links with our ancient pre-patriarchal ancestors. And then the third aspect I want to look at is the psyche and dreams of contemporary women. So this was a woman who participated in my PhD. She was perimenopausal and she said, I was crouching down nurturing a tree and I felt a gush between my legs. Now I've had a proper period again and with it an enormous spiritual and emotional shift. I'm connected with my world in a way that I haven't been for the last nine months. That night, under the stars, I felt the world is so rich and special. And she was telling me about this after the fact and saying, I really hope I get another one. I don't want that to be the last one. And she did have, I believe, another one. She contacted me to tell me about it. Beautiful swan song. And she was like, I'm so sorry that I missed this my entire menstruating life. And I said, well, look at it this way. At least you got the experience right at the end. You could have missed out completely. Then this, this is my beautiful friend Karen from Denmark. And this is her dream. I'm going to read the dream out to you. This is just a little caption of it. She says, I was at a crossroads at the time and the dream was a wake-up call. Exactly a year later, I changed my life radically. So here's the dream. I'm in the historical round tower of Copenhagen, which has a rider's staircase with gently sloping steps that can be negotiated by horses. I'm alone, walking up towards the top of the tower. Behind me on the floor to my left, a long yellow snake is following me. I think, shit, what will I do? It comes closer and starts wrapping itself around my feet, my legs, torso, and all the way up my body. I'm completely wrapped in it. I concentrate on not moving and not going into panic. The snake stops around my throat and places itself as a cobra erect. So we are directly face to face. I gather all my courage and ask, what do you want from me? I repeat this many times. I start getting very aroused, a strong sexual energy rising through my entire body. Like the snake is now inside of me and I'm riding with it from inside my entire being. It says, you are losing our connection. Don't lose connection. And I wake up in the middle of orgasm. So again, we can see the resonances in this woman who's now 41, this day and age, 
the resonances with those ancient symbols and energies of the goddess. And then this is my dream that I want to share with you that occurred during the time that I was doing my, my PhD. It was very powerful. I'm out walking my dog in the bush and suddenly I come across an enormous snake as thick as my thigh, partly coiled up to my right. Its body traces an infinity sign on the ground. It is a huge brown python. I stop, fearful, wondering whether to freeze or run. Before I can decide, the snake slithers rapidly in front of me and wheels round behind my left side. I stiffen, anticipating its strike, but its head gently nudges me firmly in the soft flesh right below my left armpit. I wake up and can still feel the imprint left by the snake's head in the flesh under my armpit. I knew the snake was trying to tell me something and I didn't know what. And eventually, after many, many actual snake sightings on my walks in the morning, I understood that the snake was a totemic invitation by the goddess and that she was asking me to take responsibility for protecting and safeguarding her menstrual power. I accepted her invitation, illuminating the beauty and the power of female spirituality then became my life work. It is my way of bringing goddess into the world and it is my way of being goddess. So now I want to guide us into another meditation. So this time on the dark goddess. So, whoops. Again, I invite you to let your eyes close gently or go into a soft gaze. When the goddess went into her dark phase, she ensured that precious remnants of her ways were kept alive by those who lived close to her body, the earth. Indigenous peoples who despite colonizing powers somehow kept her wisdom and knowledge and practices alive. We thank you, wise ones for carrying these treasures in your bloodlines down the long ages until now. We honour you, we hear your words of wisdom in these troubling times and we thank you. In those early societies that revered the dark goddess, people knew and loved her as wise and compassionate knowing that she presided over the mysteries of death, the underworld, transformation and rebirth with loving kindness. The ancient teachings held that death was a birth and that sex can be an ecstatic portal to healing, regeneration and spiritual illumination. The wisdom of the dark goddess is grounded in her inner truth and fearlessness. Completely at home in the dark, she is filled with compassion and understanding for the frailty and folly of human nature. The goddess is not a victim. She did not have her power taken away and she did not relinquish it. Women are not victims, we have always had our power. And in this processional shift into the new age, that power is once again fully available, turbocharged and ready to be released into the world in partnership with men. And what of the men? This is 
wisdom from Pat McCabe, another Indigenous elder, a Dene woman. The function of the masculine is to serve the life bringer, the life bearer, the feminine. And it needs the direction from the feminine in order to know what to do. Our world is beset by masculine practices dissociated from love partly because the deep feminine has not been accessible. The masculine needs grounding in the sacredness of matter so that its gift of abstraction of getting things done serve the greater processes of life. So when we invoke the feminine principle inside ourselves, women and men, and inside nature to guide us, we gain access to creative powers and solutions that cannot be found separately. So again, invite my panel just come back again into the here and now and again I would really love to hear from you your thoughts your reflections your yeah any comments on what I've just shared Again, there's quite a lot in there. Go ahead, Leanne. Sharon, I, I could just just feel the power in that. There was just this power um, pulsating through me during that meditation, and it wasn't and it wasn't a it wasn't a power of um, the feminine over the masculine. It was this acknowledgement of how powerful we have been, you know, in this, mm -hmm. in this place of darkness, in this place of creation. And I could feel that energy of what's being born into the world right now, you know, with this new age, yes. I, I could just, it was very emotional. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. I could, um, mm -hmm. it's hard to put into words, but I, um, yeah, I just feel very empowered. Mm, thank you, Leanne. And, you know, I, I'm aware of the sobriety of sharing those earlier facts that I, I described, like the carbon dioxide levels, and but I just feel so passionately it needs to be in our, in the forefront of our mind because we don't have the luxury of decades. This is a small window that we have, and we are poised now, and I'm going to talk about this shortly. Some of the technologies that we now have available to us to help us to do this shift, but we all need to know it and be working together. So. I'm glad that it spoke to you in that way. That's my intention. And I hope that other people have also um, gained the benefit of that as well. So thank you, Leanne. Yeah, Sharon, there's definitely a, a couple of things you, you mentioned here that, um, you know, it's really, you know, amazing. You know, one of the things that uh, you mentioned was that we put ourselves above everything, right? That, you know, we stop doing the work with others and others being plants, animals, you know, uh, lake, the sky, you know, in the end, nature's, nature and cosmos. And though I see, you know, a change of recognizing some of that, you know, in the world, I still see the opposite where there's no recognition of any of that. And- yes. You know, as, as we, I guess, you know, go through our phases, you know, beginning right now, I think that's one of the things that we have to really take to the world um, to have them really understand that aspect. But it's even beyond understanding. It's beyond, it, it gets into the aspect of then actually connecting with the feminine yes. aspects, right? And, you know, how do we go about that? You're able to share anything else with that. Yeah, totally. So it's it's very true, Robin, and I acknowledge that as well. And, you know, it's part of why I'm doing this, this talk in, in the first place. And so 
I have a few remaining slides that with some suggestions. And at the end, I have three very practical ways that we can um, fortify that connection in the way that I'm describing. So thank you for the question. And I am going to come to that shortly. Great. And I just want to, you know, mention also about the menstruation cycle. And I love the fact that, you know, there's such a celebration in, in some of the cultures out there. And I mm -hmm. wish that, you know, more of that got, gets into the Western culture. So continue Thank doing you. what you're doing to bring it forward for us, please. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Thank you. Go ahead, Barbara. Um, this one put me in a very different place than my last sharing, where it was, it seemed like it just aroused my whole cosmic consciousness of, of the biggest cycles. Um, and Sharon, I'm wondering how much of it had to do with your sharing of the wisdom of the indigenous elders. And that thing about us that Robert just mentioned, <clears throat> considering ourselves too important, <clears throat> we're not that big, we're not that important. And that we're, we, we've gotten ourselves out of alignment in so many ways. And I think our world right now is showing it. And yes. you said something right near the end of the meditation, I think, that said somehow, maybe it was in your dream or something, that the women need to show the men somehow the way or something. So can you say more, like, is it is it the women? Is that why this women's consciousness, while you're doing this work now, that women's role comes forth again to maybe lead the way into this new new phase i mean it's going to be a co-creative i'm sure you know equal yes. phase but yes this it was actually the words of pat mccabe who's <clears throat> a danae woman who lives i think in taos the function of the masculine is to serve the life bringer and life bearer the feminine and it needs direction from the feminine in order to know what to do mm -hmm. so it's that's why I'm doing what I do, I'm doing is because we, we, we have a womb that gives us a direct connection to the earth in a way that men don't. And, and that's not, it's just like the acknowledgement of differences and it gives us a particular kind of receptivity that enables us to feel and know the next step now in the dark. And we have lifetimes of practicing the dark moon of our menstruation, like especially indigenous peoples, because you know, when they, they practice their seclusion rituals, they, they receive the visions and messages from the great spirit to know what to do. And so we, we don't have that consciousness. And that's why I'm highlighting these indigenous cultures, because that's where I go to get fed and to get my perspective reset about how we can find our way forward. And I don't and really just have real a... quickly, it reminded me of uh, when I grew up, eighth grade, started my period, it was called the curse literally mm -hmm. i'm sure many of us have that and it's what a it, you know it almost makes me cry to think of how we weren't raised with this and you mentioned your you know friend who at least had those last things with her last period yes. but most of it's like oh my god i'm so glad that's over and all that and yes. i didn't particularly feel that but i i had two toddlers in my 40s so i had them both uh, at the same time and went through menopause and it was like um it, I wish, I hope, you know, that people like you will bring this to the forefront so that women, young girls, all the way through our lives, we can honor what we came here to do, who we totally. are in tradition. Totally. That's, that's what we've missed. That's the paucity of our culture that we've grown up in. And there's a real grief about that because when you see the contrast in those other Indigenous traditions, it makes you realise what you've lost. So I want to honour the grief and also know she's coming. She's coming. Yeah. Okay, so I just want to quickly finish my slides now because I want to allow enough time for the participants to ask questions. So this is another quote by Demetra George that I think is very inspiring. The feminine principle has been reborn on another turning of her evolutionary spiral. We're currently at the new moon phase. She has released a new vision that is now germinating in the mind stream of humanity. So these are some of the places where I see, feel, know she's emerging in climate change activism. Like there, here we have our schools 
doing climate strikes and and young like young kids in schools really aware of this because their future depends on it. We have sustainable technologies. I'm going to share a couple of them in a moment. The environment movement, which is with gathering momentum all the time. Social justice, particularly around gender, race, the new economics, spirituality, and most importantly for me, from my perspective, within the female body, because when we reclaim the sacredness of our bodies, we reinstate the goddess and her values in the world. We really do. So these are just some of the sustainable technologies that I and we all know of. There's solar and wind, geothermal. This ocean cleanup really inspires me, you know, in the great Pacific garbage patch. It's three times the size of France. It's estimated that these technologies can eliminate that garbage in five years. I'm very inspired by that. And then this is Andrew Bailey's Enviroplex Climate Restoration Strategy. This is a brilliant piece of sustainable technology. So this is a design that permanently captures carbon dioxide from these big fans at the top of the structure here, converts it into water, organic food and 3D printable dwellings. It can be scaled really big, it can be scaled really small. So this is like under one roof, the solution to so many of those problems. And I had the good fortune of, and privilege really of engaging with Andrew last year when I was in the Evolutionary Ambassador Program. And that's how I found out about his amazing technology. And when we had our fires here last year in Australia, I, I so wanted for the government down there to know about this because it could start being implemented as alternatives for the, for the um, rebuilding um, program that needed to happen. So it's important to know that, that, that these technologies already exist. It just needs to be accelerated and we need to have the political will and, and um, groundswell of people demanding that this need to happen. It's no longer enough to wait for governments to get it because, you know, they don't. So finally, my call to action is that my intention is to create a global network of women who are dedicated to living the sacredness of our bodies. And, you know, when I was sitting in my meditation with that this morning, I was like, I need a number. What, how, like, I can't just say that vague thing to the universe. How many women do I want? Well, I'm going to be really ambitious and say, I want a million women in this network right around the globe who are holding the intention like I am and living the sacredness of our bodies because that's what we can do. And when we do that and really tune into it, we get what's ours to do, the next doable step. Some of the ways you can be involved in my passion is by, by getting my book, Activate Your Female Power. There's also my online program through the Social Chrysalis. So, Robert, if you want to put the link to that in the chat so people can access it, it's the same platform that this Zoom is happening through. And once you have either my book or are enrolled in my program, then there's also a private Facebook group by the same name that you can. Um, request to join so and then that's all my references so I'm going to stop my share and um, yeah I'm interested to see if there are any questions from our audience it doesn't even have to be a question it can be just um, a comment or a reflection or how what I've shared may have touched you if you'd like to come on I think is it through the Q&A Robert you can raise your hand in the Q&A or you can put it in the chat and Robert can bring you in Exactly. So raise your hand and I'll uh, allow you to talk, bring in a panelist. Here we go. So we're promoting Eloise to a panelist. If you would uh, unmute yourself. All right, you should uh, be able to uh, speak, Eloise. Hello, hello. I got in a little bit late. Um, however, I've been enjoying what I've been hearing and I really, really like the very different perspective on uh, the women's cycles. Um, mm. It's, it's a, a much healthier way to look at it, a much a, a happier way to look at it as somebody else has already mentioned, it, it's not a, 
you know, curse has been said and um, something to dread and call somebody's aunt and all the, these, these different ways of looking at it and grateful when we're past it even. Yes. And to have it be something that is normal and healthy instead is really nice. Mm -hmm. Instead of something that is even ugly. Yes. Yes. Thank you, Eloise. And, and thank you for, for coming on and sharing that. And, you know, for me personally, my very first menstruation was a spontaneous spiritual awakening. It just happened. I wasn't expecting it, but that's how it happened. And so I had my own, I guess you could say, initiation directly. And then it was always my own private secret. I, I made a vow before my first menstruation that I would always honour and never complain about it. And I lived that vow my entire life. And in some ways it inoculated me against what, you know, the menstrual shame that's out there. And that was part of my, what I examined in my PhD was this phenomenon of menstrual shame. Mm -hmm. And what I identified was that menstrual shame is a key patriarchal organising principle. Because if you divest women of their menstrual power, then they're much more compliant, you know. And if they're, if they're in shame for one week out of every four for all of their lives, how are they going to do what they came here to do? So, yeah, thank you. Thank you. For You're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. I remember there was one lady, there was one lady on Facebook one time that was talking about um, the pain that she would experience and the, the anguish. Mm -hmm. And it was something for her, it was something dark, but she had also made her peace with it, partially as a result of someone that she was in love with, who was, they were the same in that regard, except that he was a guy, so he didn't have a menstrual, but it was her way of experiencing something that was actually dark. Yes, right, right. And imagine how things could change if these much healthier and, and happier attitudes and cultures were worldwide. Totally. The world would be very different. It would be the very extreme, different. It would be extremely different. Yeah. And, and women would be, you know, girls would be so at home in their bodies and carry that pride. And that quote that I had of the Apache woman, Kachina Skutani, she said, you know, you feel differently about your period after you've had get, gone through that ceremony, the becoming mm -hmm. a woman. Now carry that poise inside you. And I think I yeah. got that gift somehow, not through an external ceremony, but just through the blessing that came to me. And ever since then, I kind of felt like I had an obligation to pass the bat on, you know. Yeah. And imagine it actually being something to look forward to. Yes. <laughs> Instead of being grateful that you passed it. Yeah. Well, I used to be yeah. like that. Every time my, my bleed arrived, I was like, oh, there's my friend. And I always felt grateful that it was, it was you yeah. know, there. so yeah. it was a time of grieving for me when, when I went through menopause and it was finished. So, yep. yeah. Thank yep. you. Yep. Wonderful. Thank you're you welcome. It, oh, you're welcome. Uh, the snake, the snake aspect. Snakes have never scared me. And I like that. And I like the very different perspective on perspective on this and this as well and i wanted to mention right. that and any right. any any information regarding how we can um you know, how an individual can contribute how we can all come together where the the climate is concerned where you know all the the maybe how we have how human beings have systematically trashed the planet yes. and how we can come together even if you know when we're not doing it deliberately, but we're still, you know, not consciously, okay, I'm going to throw out these plastic bags so that I can clog the oceans. No, that's not happening. No. But it's still a mentality that needs to change. And it's that's still right. the leadership that needs to change and coming together and saying, wait a minute, as a collective voice. That's right. That's right. And the care, the care for this beautiful planet. Yeah. Absolutely, absolutely. And seeing, seeing the energy of things, there's a disconnect between, in my opinion, anyway, there's a disconnect between you know, everything is energy. And yet, a lot of people, there's not 
a, a connection. There's a disconnect between, I'm not quite sure how I want to put this or exactly what I'm yes, trying I to understand. say. <laughs> I understand. And that's what Robert was referring to earlier. So this might be a good place. So thank you, Eloise. This might be a good mm -hmm. place for me. I'd said in my email that I wanted to share three things, three practices that we can do that are, um, you know, simple, pragmatic things. So the first one is to lie on the ground on your belly with your left ear to the ground and pour out your heart. Tell her as an act of prayer, tell her all about it, whatever it is. And then when you've poured your heart out and, and spoken it all, Turn your right ear to the ground and listen. Just listen. All your concerns, all your whatever, you speak it out and then turn your right ear to the ground and listen. So that's the first practice. Second practice is to find a body of water, like a river or a lake or an ocean. I have the incredible good fortune of having a river at the bottom of my garden and so I go there frequently. Pray to the water goddess. That's her arteries, right, the rivers. Pray to the water goddess of the rivers, lakes, oceans, springs and streams. Give her, especially when you're in turbulence or distress or there's strong emotion present, I go and give her my emotion because how the water element shows up in us as humans is through our emotion. And then again, listen. This is... This is how we connect and plug back in. Listen, she's there, she'll respond. She speaks to me. She gives me insights and words of comfort. And one time I was down there not long ago crying and she told me my tears were like precious diamonds. You know, she, she responds in kind. So that's the second thing, find a body of water. The third thing is find a tree in your neighbourhood and befriend the tree. I have, I have three trees down the river that I connect with regularly. So find a tree, circle the, three, the, the tree clockwise three times and ask if you can befriend it. And if you get a yes, then ask its name. Then tell the tree about yourself and why you want to connect. And then listen. Listen, because you can't be in a relationship if it's all just you talking. You want to connect with these, the earth, the water, the tree, and listen. Be receptive. Sharon, I love that. That's amazing. Thank you for sharing that. Um, as we, you know, uh, start closing here. Any other final uh, comments from any of the attendees or panelists? Sharon, you shared so much wisdom with us and, and I'm so grateful that you have. Um, and definitely everyone, we you know, want to take Sharon's call to action to get her book, her program is Social Chrysalis, and we will follow the, the link in the um, follow-up email with recording everyone and definitely share this with everyone. This is very, you know, amazing um, information that Sharon has given to us to not just ponder, but to shift into. And that's what's so great. And then we can actually start, you know, sharing with more. Yeah, thank you, Robert. And I, I feel like for me personally, it's, it's too big a vision for me to carry on my own. I said this in the last talk as well. I, I need my community of women who who also deeply believe in this and who also feel the urgency of what's happening with the planet and are, are committed to doing their bit for it. I need that community of women because it's too big for me to do on my own. So if, if what I'm speaking about speaks to you deeply, then please connect with me because I need to know you and we need to be in this together. We need to be in the ship, finding our way forward together. I would love to hear if there are any other remaining comments from anybody. We've got like four minutes. Somebody yes, would love to. please. And, and, you know, by all means, you know, Sharon, I know you're looking for a bunch of women, but, you know, this man you know, supports you too. So oh, we'll make you, sure Robin. we move things forward. <laughs> <laughs> thank you. Yes, of course. Well, yes. we, we, you know, we, we as women, I need men 
guys like you and Walter and my husband, Jared, to have my back so I can do what I'm doing fearlessly. Yes. There's security yes. that comes from having a man have your back for you that when that's not there, something significant is missing. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So here we, uh, we're going to allow uh, Lisa to uh, be promoted as a panelist and to talk. Um, right. So we're having Lisa come in here. Right. And then I saw Walter with his hand up. So we'll go to Walter after Lisa. Thank you, Walter. So we're getting you to mute here, Lisa. There she goes. Yep. Okay, you're unmuted, Lisa. I'd love to hear from you. Ah, oh, there you are. Hello, Sharon. Hello. And, and hello, everybody. Um, I'd just like to um, say that I was um, deeply um, touched and inspired by your um with with your knowledge and your sharing um and it personally it just um helps me on my journey i um i relate a lot to what you're saying and you know but i never knew about this um emergence of the feminine you know until i met you and um with your delivery i really feel that it it touches me and inspires me to um continue on my journey to be the best that I can be for the planet. Yes, that's beautiful, Lisa. Thank you. I'm so glad. That's my intention. And I can see how moved you are by that. And, you know, um, uh, it's so meaningful to me to know that it lands in that way because it's so close to my heart. So when I see somebody move to tears, I, I just feel this huge relief and gratitude really to her that, that I'm not, speaking into a vacuum and it's kind of probably my unlearning about the void as a vacuum like Jared made reference to earlier that the void is full of potential but when you don't when I don't see that it's like I feel like I'm speaking alone and so when I connect with other people and get that kind of response it's really heartening to me so thank you and thank you for your amazing work that you also do on behalf of her the divine feminine thank you for coming on so lovely thank you lisa thank you very much walter you'd like to well, share yes uh i've been feeling guilty about being a man and uh, then the notion of the right hand and the left hand uh could you talk a little bit more about the left hand and the right hand joining together and what we can do uh, to change things. Yes. I, mean, I, know, I know your focus is on the, on the mm. divine feminine, but there, there's a role the masculine can play in this. And Absolutely. Absolutely, Walter. It's a wonderful question. Thank you. So, so that, that was from the Australian Indigenous wisdom, physically and functionally different, akin to right and left hands but without hierarchy and my this is what I live in my life too with my my beloved man that we are co-empowering with each other and that um that we are in in the so in the previous round before the patriarchy I think there was there's that whole thing that I shared last time about Crete of male female partnership but I don't think back then it was possible to have the understanding of how crucial men are, for example, in their role in reproduction because they didn't know about sperm back then. Well, we now know that and we've gone right through the dark phase where ma the masculine has come into ascendancy without the benefit of the deep feminine. Now that wheel is turning and the design like I just think when I go back to the physiology, it's only sperm that can ignite egg. It's the same, the, the masculine and men have this spark about them. And in, in my um, shamanic tradition that I'm part of, it's said that the role of the masculine is to be cedar, protector, provider. And cedar 
the cedar is who brings the spark that ignites things. So um, men have such a crucial role to play. It's not that you don't have a role in it. And there's, you know, when you're speaking about the guilt, why I wanted to share this piece was because guilt is really kind of a hangover from the patriarchy in a way. If you think of that, that you're absolved from that. And, and in a way, I kind of feel like that's what needs to happen globally. We need to absolve the debt and absolve and cancel, even economically, because now we're into a new age and, and the partnership, the right and left hands together is what can create balance, male-female balance. So it's, it's no good just having women. It's no good just having men. We need each other and we need the masculine and feminine balance, just like in the yin-yang diagram where you've got that circle and the two little bits of each other inside. We're meant to do it together. That's the design. Yes, amen, Sharon. And that was great, you know, and, and Walter, you know, speaking, you know, a, as a man uh, as well, this whole guilt thing, um, you know, it's, it's, it's definitely designed, like Sharon said, at the patriarchy, you know, the guilt, the shame, the blame, it's to keep us all limited because yes. um, no one wants to be able to feel that guilt, shame, or blame. Um, so we all stay small and, and don't want to go there. Well, that's why, you know, Sharon saying, boom, let's just eliminate that debt and everything else and be done with it. So it's really, you know, that's where we need to go. All right. So I'm going to allow uh, Jared to uh, come in and uh, speak here. Uh, I think it's only appropriate that, you know, Jared gets a chance to uh, find, you know, finish this up for us. So Jared, we're bringing in, in as a panelist, gonna have you uh, unmute and uh, wonderful. There you are. You can see me, right. Yes. Yeah, it's probably, I just wanted to comment uh, on what you said, um, Robert, about that, um, the effects of patriarchy. I remember in the, I think it was the seventies, I read a book by a lady called Baker Miller, I think. And she was uh, an early feminist, and um, and one of the things that was uh, I particularly sort of connected to was that she said patriarchy doesn't just affect women; it affects men, because men are not who they are in patriarchy. They're not. It it it, it can't affect just half the population and not have an impact on the whole population. And so that's always been something that I've been aware of, that sometimes the, the experience, the, there's, the guilt comes from, I, I think, uh, my perspective on it, Walt, is that that guilt comes from a perspective as if somehow we've been advantaged. And, and that's not true. The truth is that we've been impoverished as men. And I would even use the word that patriarchy in some way, while it presents some power over, it emasculates men. And it actually stops us from being able to spark the female. Um, and, and I don't mean just in a sexual sense, because the sexual function can happen and we're still emasculated uh, because we're not bringing that spark energy into the relationship with our feminine. And the feminine are the holders of the space that can take the spark and create something beautiful out of it. And, um, and that's, that, I think, is something. That's what I understand about the partnership there's the recognition that there's a, a vessel, a body that holds, and there's a body and a vessel that sparks. And through that, then things can happen. And it's like even in the last few days of me trying to communicate to Sharon my, my love and support of her when I know she's been wrestling with how she presents this, this, um, this information. And, and that's my way of sparking. She's been holding it but it's my way of sparking her has been just simply to support her, to let her be, to let her, to let her be in her space, which probably has been a bit dark, but it's just to let it be, let, let it happen. And it has happened. Like it's been a very powerful presentation uh, that you've put together today, Sharon. And I just want to honor and acknowledge your courage in putting it out there to the universe. Thank you. Thank you. Well, Thank well you. spoken and lovely. Thank you, Jared. Yes. Let me just respond and say that um, I know we're over time and I'll keep it brief. But I remember when you had that book by Jean Baker Miller, what a, what a revelation it was to me as a young woman to hear a man owning the cost of the patriarchy for him. And in some ways, 
the advantage, I mean, there's obvious ways in which men seem advantaged by the patriarchy, but it's at such cost to their humanity. I don't think there's any argument about that. So thank you for highlighting it. And thank you for your support in the last little while as it's been me going through my dark phase to get to this moment in time. So yeah, thank you everyone. And thank you panel and back to you, Robert. Yes, thank you, Sharon and panelists, attendees. We're so grateful for you joining us and we are looking forward to seeing you again uh, in January for another round table. And we'll give you more information uh, about what that's gonna be. So watch for your email. All right, everyone, thank you so much. Have a great holiday season and a new year. It's gonna be amazing. All right, bye-bye now. Thank you, bye.